there was another thing too that I never forget that um, uh, Jackie uh, approached me one time on the set. Uh, and he, he looked, he, he was like, so, uh, you're with, you're with Samuel, right? And I said, yeah, yeah, he's, he's, he's my, he, he took, he took me in and sort of, uh, showing me this stuff and I'm here because of him. And he goes, oh, okay, that's, that's very good. You're very loyal to Samuel then. I said, yes. <clears throat> and he said, um, well, if you ever, uh, if you ever want, you know, there's a, there's a place, uh, on my team for you. If you, if you ever decide. To, to change your mind and I, it was like i was super like honored and like oh my goodness this is an interview with reuben langdon reuben is a stuntman an actor and a motion capture performer perhaps best known for his work on the resident evil and devil may cry games we talk about many things including his training as a stuntman in japan working on japanese video games and his very unique story of living with samuel hung while working on martial law i'm going to start at the beginning and uh, talk about what it was that young reuben langdon grew up watching and uh playing yeah so let's see what did i grow up watching big influences uh at a younger age obviously with anime loved uh anything you know coming from asia as far as martial arts and um particularly japan with this samurais and ninjas and i guess action cinema or chambada action cinema back in the day that i watched enough of that to really uh get excited over it and and at the time i didn't know you know as a young kid i didn't know the difference between kung fu cinema and like Cham, chambara um samurai action films like they're all kind of in the same those asian guys that have bad dubbings of voices right that's that's all i knew then power rangers came out which was a a big influence because now all my my anime has come to life in a sense but at the same time pre uh going to japan this interest in uh hong kong cinema so i growing up in atlanta georgia i had a small asian community but those were all my buds so i hung out with uh, the vietnamese guys the lao asian guys um we had one korean and because of my interest in in anime uh they and i had all you know i had all the latest anime stuff at the time I was sort of pinned the uh even though I was the only Caucasian guy in the Asian crew I was pinned the uh the ja they call me the Japanese guy cuz we didn't have a Japanese guy in my in my crew um and I was studying the language I was you know adamant about Japanese stuff so uh but all of them had we had exposure to the Vietnamese um uh movie rental store at the time we, you know VHS was still a thing so we had to go get our, uh, they would watch all their Vietnamese shows, but they would also get um, like the latest Jet Li film dubbed in Vietnamese because they had it at the at the uh, uh, Vietnamese market. And we as a group, my friends and I, we would go to Chinatown and rent the latest Jackie Chan film or, you know, this was before he was even came stateside. So we were big fans of of Asian Hong Kong cinema um before even going to japan so i don't know if that, that just to set the stage of like <laughs> my experiences of where i was getting my influences uh being you know white guy in the middle of america atlanta georgia not the middle but south deep south and um <clears throat> and uh that just exposed me to a whole world of mystical you know you're watching uh Jet Li and Donnie Yen have a fight uh which was it once upon a time in China too right and they're you know kicking the sticks around and jumping from place to place like it's just it's it's insanity coming from a western eyes at that time like we'd never seen anything like it so uh I was mesmerized and that uh interest in Hong Kong cinema never left in fact it, it got stronger and stronger once I at the age of 19 moved to Japan and was now had access every movie store like every blockbuster every uh video store you could go to had its own hong kong cinema section not just the action but also dramas and stuff like that so while living in japan 
being exposed to the Japanese uh, action cinema, I was an adamant follower and researcher and just dove deep into uh, Hong Kong cinema. And, and it was definitely way more prevalent in Japan in just everyday J Japanese society than in the U S like we had to hunt and search for it. We're there every video store, everybody know who Sammo Hung is. Everybody know who Jackie Chan and Yun Biao, they, they like, it's, that's part of their culture as well, even though it's another culture, it's Hong Kong culture and <clears throat> a different, uh, demographic they were very much uh integrated into japanese society talk about why you why you learned japanese and what drove you to move to japan a lot of people say i have a past life in japan <laughs> um the as a kid so I, I i at a young age i was blessed to find uh find out what i was passionate about i was very I, I was in love with all of the, uh, as a kid, all of the shows uh, that I liked were Japanese animation shows. So like Star Blazers, uh, Gotcha Man, which is Battle of the Planets, Macross, Robotech, big fan of video games as, as they were emerging from, you know, from Nintendo to um, Genesis to all that stuff. So that was sort of my world. I was in that nerd world cu culture. And at a young age, I'd say probably in junior high school, I went to a uh, Star Trek convention with my mom. Uh, and there was this little section uh, where they had these guys with booths that had, um, uh, they were showing Macross the movie in Japanese. And I was like, what? Why is this thing in Japanese? What are they talking about? It's like, this is Japanimation, man. Don't you get it? And I was like, oh, Japan animation, I don't know what that is. And why is this show and that show and all my favorite shows, why are they all speaking Japanese? So at that, after that convention, I sort of had this huge awakening that, man, I must like Japanese stuff, you know, because all of my favorite shows are from Japan. So that got me on the path of just seeking out every, anything and everything Japanese. And I had already been a fan of the ninjas and the samurais, but I really found my focus and the more i dove into uh the animation world uh the stories why that culture fascinated me what was it about the stories and that type of storytelling that fascinated me so i started that that dive in and just knew from a young age i've got to get to japan like there's something there that's pulling me and drawing me and and it's 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 a combination of of the culture and the anime and martial arts and the whole this whole thing i just got to get there so uh really from junior high school until the age of 19 it was my one and only goal is to get to japan i don't know how i was gonna get there but i needed to save money i needed to get there so uh so that was that was the main driver uh what I, you could probably say anime but it's a little oversimplification mm. Did you have martial art training at the time in Japanese styles as well in America? No, I did not. So I uh, I had done like a two month uh, Taekwondo thing when I was in junior high school or elementary school even other and then and I had taken up a little bit of Aikido because I, there was a, a um, they offered an Aikido, an, Aikido, an Aikido school opened up near where I was living in Georgia um, back in the day. And uh, so like early 90s, and I got a few lessons of that in. And I was like, oh, it's cool. It's Japanese. But I was actually very uh, fond of, um, you know, Bruce Lee style, uh, Jeet Kune Do and Wing Chun. And I remember driving in Atlanta, I would drive like two, three hours to Francis Fong's studio. And because um, he, he had a Wing Chun school there. And I was like, this is the shit, man. Francis Fong is badass and he knows the Wing Chun stuff. And that's what Bruce Lee studied. So it's so cool. Anyways, uh, and I would just hang out. I couldn't afford lessons uh, in Wing Chun at the time, especially because the school was so far. So it would be like me and a couple of my buddies, um, the Lao Asian crew. And uh, we would go there and just sit in the window and just watch them work on the dummy and do the whole thing. Right. So, um, and so that that was that was the extent of my training until I got to Japan, and again, just like Hong Kong movies in every movie store, 
it's something I could um, easily access. Like there's, there's a school there, there's a school there, or there's, you know, where can I get martial art training? And uh, there was a, Aikido was really easy to access. And since I had a little bit of background in it, that was my first um, martial art that I got into while living in Japan Bef prior to the, uh, almost simultaneously to the action schools. So at that time, uh, were you coming into contact with action schools or was this, was this even a thought in your mind to pursue action? Yeah, it, it, uh, I had no idea that the action schools even existed, but I, um, I went to, I was going to a, a local like city gym. They have, uh, city run gyms, I guess, kind of like a YMCA kind of thing, but in every city in Japan, the, the, the government usually has a small budget to allocate towards like parks and, many times within the park, they'll build a, a city gym that you pay a small fee. You don't have to be a member. Uh, anybody can go in and you pay like two to three bucks per visit. And, uh, and you have access to equipment. Some of it's really outdated depending on which city you're going to, but, uh, but it's kind of cool. Cause then they have, um, you know, like a trainer, that's that's there and you, helps get you checked in and you know you can do things so i was going to this local city gym and uh talking to one of the trainers there and in my at the time my japanese was still very limited i was only in japan for about six months or so and sort of explaining i was looking for a gymnastics place because i had no exposure to gymnastics as a, as a kid but i really wanted to do a backflip like jackie chad right this was like life goals so uh i remember going to the gym and talking to the trainer about hey you know are you a fan of jackie chan you know you know who i'm talking about yeah yeah and, and and i was like well is there any gymnastic schools in town i i want to be like jackie chan and he's like you want to be like jackie chan then you don't go to gymnastic school actually he Initially, uh, I did look for gymnastic schools and nobody would take me in. They said, yeah, I'm just too old. I was, you know, 19, year, 19 years old. And they were like, yeah, you're too old to learn gymnastics. We're not going to take you in. So um, I explained that to, to my buddy at the gym, too. I was like, I've been to a couple of places. And he's like, well, you know, if you want to be like Jackie Chan, you got to come to action school. And uh, And I was like, what? Action school? What is that? So he uh, he invited me. He's like, well, I go every Wednesday. I go to the Toei Action Club, uh, which was, you know, it's a it's a minor one in the in the scheme of things of 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 um, Japanese and in the Japan and their action schools. Um, but nonetheless, they uh, they got together at this gymnastics gym once or twice a week. And they did uh, basic karate and then they, we did gymnastics and then we did fight scenes. And I was like, this is amazing. This is exactly what I wanted to learn. Um, and it was only, uh, it felt not very long after I had joined uh, the action school, Toy Action Club, and was getting lessons that I got called for an audition for uh, B-Fighter Kabuto, which is... Uh, one of the Japanese tokusatsu shows. They had a role written in for a high school exchange student from New York. And uh, I physically fit that role. So I, I went to the audition and I'd already been training at Toei. And it was like, oh my God, this is so cool. I hope this, this all works out. And it did. I ended up landing the job. And now it was, I went from training once a week with Toei Action Club to now on set every day training with japan action club or japan action enterprise is what they're now known as but i think they may have they may have still were owned by sony chiba back in when i was doing it jac um <clears throat> or they hadn't made that transition but uh yeah so it was it was like wow now i'm doing it every day on set with the most badass team in japan uh which was super cool can you talk about what what they were teaching at the Toei Action Club, what kind of fight choreography, what was the martial arts style? It was definitely karate based. Um, I couldn't tell you which, which karate uh, at the time. I, a lot of, a lot of it is Shotokan stuff is what is from what I remember, but um, depends on, on the teacher and, and his background. 
but yeah, that was sort of the base. So we're all, you know, hitting basic karate poses in between our action. You know, we're doing the bigger, the, you know, the stuff you see, I, kind of Power Rangers stuff. You know, it's kind of its own style in a way, but uh, definitely those influences. So striking the pose after, uh, you know, you beat up the bad guys and the bad guys, the way they, the way we were doing the choreography was very much in a Toei style of longer takes. It works really well for training because when you're filming a fight scene, obviously, you know, there's those sections of long fight choreography that's going on, but a lot of it's inserts, quick things, you know, it's very choppy uh, where the training for, let's say, toy action school was more of a samurai chambada style. Uh, and that's uh, that all comes from that roots anyways, but with some hong kong flair a little bit and but i think ultimately the training was basic from chambada uh sword fighting so and they had their own chambada schools and classes that uh focused mostly on chambada action so it was kind of coming from that uh lineage is is i think the, the closest thing karate was- mixed with Chambada with <laughs> mixed with flashy Power Ranger stuff. Yeah, was there a was there a because from from what I've heard, the Chambara style of action is it's pretty simple. It's like eight directions and a stab. Was there yeah. a similar simplicity to the yes. hand? Yes, exactly. That's that's where I would say it's more coming from that lineage is because when we, uh, you basically had your master shot that your um whoever's choreographing the scene or you know creating the 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 tachi maori right uh which is the same word in korean which is funny uh which is like fight scene right tachi maori Uh, tachi means to stand and maori means you know to go around so um the uh the the way they sort of set it up and and again at, at, at this time i didn't i had the the influence of Hong Kong cinema and the uh, and the interest in Hong Kong cinema, but I didn't really know the big differences. You know, this was in my, as a martial artist, I was just learning some basics with Aikido. I was a Bruce Lee fan. I didn't understand the history and the culture and the major differences in martial arts I knew, but in the action stuff, it was still the action world was still new to me at that time. So my only really exposure to action cinema was, uh, for, uh, other than watching the movies, was this this new experience I was getting at the uh, action schools. Um, they were doing, they were showing us how to do backflips and back handsprings, and I thought Jackie Chan can do that, so that's cool. That's all I wanted to know. Um, but basically. Um, uh, what do we, oh yeah, very linear. The, the guys would, uh, uh, you'd have sort of the audience, right? We would all watch the scene and we would rotate. So you have your main, your main, uh, the guy who created the scene would go through and have his, they call them the, uh, centuine or the, um, uh, I don't know the minions, the bad guys, right? Your, your, your. Uh, what, what, what do we? I, I get confused sometimes. My head doesn't work in all the languages. Do we have a language for that in English? Like goons, the goons, henchmen, right? Henchmen, yes, henchmen, goons, right? So in Japanese, the sentuin, um, and then you have the the main guy, right? The hero, and you know they come in at different angles at different times, and then you have this is where you learn how to keep it moving in the scene. So you're constantly, you know, as your goon, you're, you're, you're crossing this guy over here and you're crossing this guy and then you go in and then this guy goes in and it's that basic setup every time. If you've got, if you're dealing with two or three or five or whatever that is, but it's always kind of one long master shot. And, and that's how we would, tra- we would train with the fight scenes at the end. And then we'd throw in a, a dive roll or depending on, what the uh, performer can do, you know, here's where we do the back handspring and then we land and then we pose and then we do our fight. (laughs) Would you say that this training was more to help these, you call them centuine in Japanese? Right, right. So that a centuine could work with an actor safely or was this to train the center guy to perform against the stuntman? It's always about the centuine. 
actually you you hit it on the head so it was it was always about cuz the the hero would only very few people could get to that role we would try it we'd rotate in our circles but the first thing they told me was uh incentoing is for the power ranger type stuff um there's another name for it it's skipping my mind right now um so scene they called the scene so whoever's in the main main uh place is sort of the scene but the the other guys the goons the henchmen i remember it was told and i and and i, I remember my mind being blown at the time like the centering is more important than the hero and i'm like what that makes no sense the guy on the screen is good. And, then, and then they explained it to me they said you know the only reason he looks as good as he is is because of all the goons doing their thing and they're hitting their timing and um and you know it's very difficult and you have to be there for the guy for the hero if you're not there at that moment then you know so is that whole thing so that was my introduction to action cinema was through the japanese lens uh first and then later through you know travels and working in the other industries so what what scene. would happen if you messed up as a centuin you come in too early you run into the to the actor he falls down what what happens to you on set uh well on set i never got that far i was still very much in the basic phases so in the training uh i didn't get that far until i actually moved out of japan um but in training you were humiliated i mean it was it was um it 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 did not go well and um because you know J japanese culture is you don't want to be that there's that saying in japanese culture uh uh nails if a nail sticks up it's got to get bit, beaten down so <clears throat> it's very much um a goal for most japanese not to be the sticking the nail that sticks out so if you uh if you didn't hit your mark and didn't do the right thing you would be that nail that stuck out and everybody include especially the teacher would uh make it known and you would feel, <laughs> feel miserable <laughs> So, I only stuck out because I was a white guy in the room. Yeah. So uh, I kind of had a free pass in a lot of ways. <laughs> you learn how to do this. You go on set yeah. uh, and then you're working with Japan Action Club. Is it yeah. is it the same system? Like what what's that like then by comparison? I I immediately found the level, <laughs> the number of people. So Toei was a niche thing and there were some really uh talented instructors there, but um at the time this is in the early 90s or i'm sorry mid 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 and late 90s um you just the the level of talent and the numbers of people with extreme amount of talent just blew my mind i was like whoa where did all these guys come from and um and uh you, you know i remember going and training and kane kane kusugi was training there on tuesday nights and we hang out with him for a minute and talk so are you talking about japan action club or toei now uh japan action club okay gotcha. so, so yeah kane uh he had been cast on a show like me uh like a year or two earlier so you, we kind of got the free invite once you have made made it on the show then um you know we got it i got invited to to even after the show finished to continue to train with jack and it was a lot of fun it was, it was trained with them and a bunch of other schools as well. But yeah, it was, uh, there's a lot of really talented cats in Japan uh, because of the structure of the schools. And I think the rigidness and the, um, it really pushed people to, to be as, as good as they could, could be. Can you talk about the, uh, what you guys would do at a, uh, at a Jack training session and how that choreography worked and maybe compare it to the Toei? style yeah so i think i remember on, it was like tuesdays and thursdays on jack and tuesdays was gymnastics day for more gymnastics fo uh oriented focused and uh thursdays i believe was Chamba chambara day so uh basically um karate was still the basics so we all did you know the basic you know karate warm-ups and then um <clears throat> And then we did, uh, then gymnastics was, was like on the gymnastics days, they'd roll out the mats. And these are not like gymnastic gyms. These are, 
um, high school um, basketball courts and these giant mats are then rolled out and they're just, you know, they're thick. So they're, it's like, it's like doing a backflip on the carpet, uh, some big fluffy carpet, but not, it's not a spring floor. So there was still not much give. So uh, I remember coming back to the States because this is the first time I was exposed to gymnastics was in Japan. And coming back to the States, I'm like, oh my God, it's so much easier here. Like we have it so easy with all of our, you know, uh, bungee things and equipment and how to, you know, our big round blocks to practice back handsprings off of. It is just the, that is very rare in Japan. So most people learn how to do a back flip you know on on uh concrete or on or just on a regular wooden floor or something so um then they would bring out the trampoline mini tramp so we do a uh, mini tramp work and you know run hit the tramp do front flip back flip you know um brownies and all that stuff so uh that was essentially it on mondays and then on tuesdays we do the karate and then they everybody busts out their their bokens, right? Their wooden swords. And then everybody would do Chambada Tachimari um, style, uh, where on Mondays with the gymnastics oriented stuff would be more of the Power Ranger style fight fight scene. So <clears throat> two very distinct, uh, one, because everybody's got a sword in their hands, but that was just equally as important to them because J Jack was supplying most of the talent for most of like the uh, um, Chambada films at the time, you know, uh, which still even during their daytime dramas, they had, you know, a lot of uh, not as heavy action oriented as like uh, Zatoichi or that kind of stuff. But you still have your daytime, you know, drama about the the emperor and, you know, you'd have you have a little fight scene bust out and those were all Jack guys you know so the way the the way these clubs work too is it wasn't just like i had a free pass because i was a, a foreigner and i don't think it's you could get the free pass that i had at that time um i was kind of an anomaly because i had done the show the toy show people were like oh it's the it's that guy yeah it's the you know token white guy all right come train with us and they'd invite me in to train with them. And I would usually pay, you know, we work out some sort of like um, uh, fee, you know, for depending on the school and, uh, you know, like 10 bucks a lesson or 15 bucks a lesson, whatever. <clears throat> and um, everybody else, though, that was part of that school was also part of the agency Japan Action Enterprise, the the talent agency. So they were on specific contract and they couldn't work with any other um, group. Um, and this was at the time, the whole industry has now shifted. Freelance is the main, but at the time you had to be registered in one specific group, the Kuda Action Club, the um, Japan Action Enterprise, uh, and then others started to form Toei Action, uh, but they were all an agency. They essentially were a agency first and a school second. And usually uh, you paid your fee as an a to be part of the agency. And then they would send you off on auditions or work or whatever. So the schools and the agencies went hand in hand. And because I was represented by this a Gaijin agency and I was kind of freelance, they um you know, then they they knew that they wouldn't be able to promote me in their shows or whatever because of that I'm not the demographic that they'd be promoting. So I, again, I got kind of a free pass uh, or the ability to train at all these different places, which was awesome because I got to see the differences between them and the different styles. But I also never got the full detailed instruction that someone that was paying the money got. So I was more an observer because some of these like Japan action school, they were brutal. Like, like if they were in school, like in the States right now, they'd have lawsuits all, <laughs> all over because, you know, the way they literally would beat some of their, uh, you know, the ones, the students that kind of were, you know, they held back in some places, but yeah, we, we would not, um, we would be calling that full on, um, <laughs> Uh, you know, what do you call it? <laughs> workplace violence. I don't know. <laughs> Work, workplace violence, abuse. Yeah. Um, 
and and that uh, you know it's changed now i don't think it's as as brutal as it was but um yeah it was you know i'd see the wooden sticks getting smacked on people and they didn't do that to me because i was the token white guy so i got off pretty pretty easy but i also didn't get the hardcore training that these other guys did until uh i moved back to the states and started working with alpha stunts and I don't, that's a whole nother thing i can yeah i want to hear all about that um but first i wanted to ask what was the feeling within the school within the schools about other schools were they antagonistic towards other schools was it kind of like a martial arts rivalry yeah yeah a little bit um there was a respect for especially for the 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 top dogs you know so um and a lot of them say someone over at jack maybe started at jack got a couple good years of basics and then would go over to kurata and then learn kurata there was a couple of those guys but most of them were once you're Jack, you're Jack all the way, you know, next 10, 15 years. Same with the Kurata Club. And they uh, they would hang out sometimes at social gatherings and stuff. But there was very much this this difference in school and approach. And, and, and uh, Kurata definitely have, being the Hong Kong style influences definitely were, were, were much stronger with Kurata you, and his. Did you ever get to go to Kurata, Kurata school? I did. Yeah, I did, which was, uh, it was a little bit later, but yeah, I got, <clears throat> because of my interest in Hong Kong cinema, it was just like a natural draw to go check out the Kudata school and, and, and hang out with, um, some of their teachers and get, and, and, and that ended up being sort of where I fell in all of it after my Japan Action Club training and everything, sort of the schools that I ended up and the groups I ended up training with were Kuda and, and created the the longer lasting relationships that I have now still uh, friends with those guys is, is Kuda, more the Kuda crowd. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever get to meet any of the high ups at Japan Action Club, club like uh, Sonata or any of the... Uh... Sonata was before my day, um, but uh, Jito, I don't know if his name is... His, I don't know if these guys, if they ever... In my world, they were you know, superstars, but I, the ones, yeah, Sonata and, and, um, those guys were more of the early days of Jack later as Jack started to, to lose his popularity and is probably when I got in and they were mostly just known for their Sentai shows and Chambada. And then if you got a name, uh, for yourself, it wasn't because you were acting on screen. It was because you were the best stunt guy so they really shifted from a um cultural uh how do i say like an iconic cultural thing which in those early days even there were some female actresses i forget their names that came out of that yeah sushiomi that, right okay yeah yeah so they that side of it had already died down so now by the time i had joined Japan Action Club was really just known for creating stuntmen. There wasn't any uh, big name actors coming out of it. So then you come to the States. Is that sort of the next point of the journey here? Or, or is there uh, actually, more in Japan I, that you want to cover? Um, that was it. That was it. But I actually went to Hong Kong first. Oh, cool. Yeah, let's go um, there. Sort of this this desire to get closer to that style. And, and by training and living in Japan... Um, and, and and immersing myself in in the um the language the culture and the in the action cinema training right that i had really found my what i loved <laughs> was uh obviously the culture and, and everything else but this this passion for action cinema really just kept getting d deeper and greater as i was living in japan and uh getting to hong kong was sort of the next goal and um it was in, in Hong Kong being close to Japan. It's only like a two hour, three hour plane ride. So, uh, so I wanted, it was in 1997 is, is, uh, right after the handover, um, back to, from British to Chinese rule, uh, was my first trip to, to Hong Kong. And, um, I had, 
uh, a phone number from one of my Kurara buddies said, oh, if you're going to go to Hong Kong, there's uh, one of my, you know, my kohais, one of my underclassmen, his name's Kenji. You should, uh, Kenji Tanigaki, you should give him a call. He's been living in, in Hong Kong and, and working with uh, Donnie Yen. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'll give him a call. So my first time right off the plane in Hong Kong, I, I give Kenji a call and he's like, ah, oh, Oh, okay. Yeah. If you're friends with that guy, sure. Come on over. Basically. It's like, um, right now we're editing Donnie's latest movie. It's, um, uh, I think it was called brotherhood of the wolf. Do you know that one? That uh, one? It was, uh, I don't know. Legend what of the wolf. Name. Legend of the wolf. Okay. Yeah. 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 So I go straight pretty much from the airport to this. I think it was in home. It was where the old airport, this is before the airport moved too. So it was the old iconic airport that was like one of the hardest airports to land in in Kowloon City. And um, I think it was in Kowloon City, not far from the airport, uh, that Kenji and Donnie were editing on old old Steinbeck style film, you know, cut. And, <laughs> this is before the digital age. And uh, and I go over there and, and within, I remember within like two hours getting off the plane, and I'm sitting in front of Donnie Yen having a conversation with Donnie and Kenji. And they're like, who are you? And I'm like, oh, I'm like this white guy. I live in Japan and go to the schools there. And where are your schools? Um, so that was that. That was my f- first intro there, and then uh, through another connection, through uh, friends in in the in the um, uh, J- Japanese action world, uh, there was a film being uh, made, a co- Japanese Hong Kong co-production, and I, it was the last film to be filmed in the uh, Golden Harvest lot. <clears throat> so I got in there and I, I, cause I had friends that were working on the film. So I got to kind of hang out on set and see, uh, see a whole different side of filmmaking that I hadn't seen before. Um, was that Tokyo so Raiders? I, that was prior to Tokyo Raiders. It was called, okay. um, um, what was it called? Um, ex- no, no, that wasn't it. What was it? It, it was with, um, Sawada. Do you know Sawada Kenya? He was in Street Fighter, I yeah. think, in the original Street Fighter movie. He, yeah. He was like some kind of Captain Sawada, I think, was his name in the Street Fighter movie. But um, he was, it was his production. He had gotten a budget together and he had, um, and, and some of my um, action buddies from Kurata were working on it. Um, not Kenji, but some other guys. So, uh, so yeah, anyways, that was sort of, I, I, uh, and, oh, and I got, I got to become pretty good friends really quickly with, uh, Samo's son, Samo Hung's, one of his sons, he has three sons. And, um, he was working on the film as a translator because he spoke fluent Japanese and, uh, English and Cantonese. And, uh, he was on set translating. Anyways, I arrived there and just immediately started hanging out with him. And it was, uh, he was showing me around and, Within, I'd say a week, I'd met pretty much everybody in the Hong Kong film industry. <laughs> it was pretty crazy <laughs> uh, at the time, um, and uh, so I, I stayed there and and kind of went back and forth for for a number of months, back and forth to um, uh, Japan, and was trying to sort of figure figure the whole thing out. And then I realized there just wasn't any roles other than bad guy roles. And at the time uh, I had a crazy baby face and I just didn't have the bad bad guy look. So I wasn't getting casted as a bad guy. And that's all they wanted the the Guaylo guys for is to play the bad guys. So I was like, shoot, what do I do? Uh, And then that's when I, um, after several cries and attempts and just little bit parts here and there, in both uh, uh, Japan and in Hong Kong, um, then I decided to move back to the states and figure that uh, I, that would be the next step. So, same thing. Contacted some stunt friends, and they were like, "Yeah, you should go to you know America. You know that's Koichi and Alpha Stunts. They're all former uh, Kurata guys." So that connection, having that connection with Kurata and and his team mates. Uh, was definitely a big influence in my career going both to Hong Kong and coming back to the States to work on Power Rangers. 
was that your first job is doing power rangers when you came to the states yes 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 it was it was interesting because at the simultaneously samo was doing martial law the tv show martial law and uh because of the connections with his son so i was working on power rangers and martial law kind of simultaneously back and forth and uh got my sag card on martial law and then um but but was working both both martial law and power rangers kind of in between <laughs> was it very different going from one to the other was it a totally different kind of action mindset not really um because koichi had such a large uh, hong, you know koichi and all the kurata guys had a major uh, hong kong influence so hong uh so us power rangers working under koichi was a very different type of power ranger experience or sentai than japan action club the way uh he shot it was more hong kong style um the the you didn't have the long master like uh the other stuff um so it was it was more koichi was definitely more of a hong kong style guy than than the japanese style uh however he you know you he he grew up in that too so he knew the differences and was able to use the 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 Japanese style in a convenient way when he needed it and go and f- but his default was always to c- kind of go back to the to the Hong Kong style. So it was a mix. It was a mix match. Would you say that Koichi learned um, movement and filmmaking from Karada's school? Movement for sure. The filmmaking part. Um, I think he learned on Power Rangers. Like he just, uh, he, you know, he, I'm sure he got some of the basics from uh, Kurata, but the schools, this is the one thing in um, that that they're probably doing now more, but back then they weren't, is they weren't teaching the filmmaking aspects. They just simply taught what to do in front of the film. Uh, so it wasn't as integrated, I think, as it is now. Now everybody has, you know, a, a cell phone or uh, some sort of access to a camera, and uh, just like you know y- yourself and the Zero Gravity team and those guys from uh, the Bay Area that would just watch a lot and copy, right? It always blew my mind. I'm like, how do these guys get as good as they are just from watching and copying? It blows my mind. But it. it, it you know, it is uh, trial and error and seeing what works and what doesn't. And, and then, you know, watching the uh, the stuff on cinema that does work and you're like, how did they get that effect? And, you know, but um, in Japan during when I was there for the schools, there was very little emphasis on shooting style. It was more of a movement style and um, and just performing the moves in a certain way. Gotcha. So <clears throat> let me understand this. So in Japan, they hired Jack to do the action. Is that correct mm-hmm. for Power Rangers? But in America, they allowed alpha stunts. Correct. Yeah, okay. very different. Two, That's two why different. Okay. two different things. So most, uh, I mean, a lot of the action, in, uh, if not all of it, would get reshot in in America with uh, Koichi and his team. This the when they, especially in the later days, but especially when they got in the the only thing they really kept from the old series was the big uh the big robot stuff right they when they're on stage and they're beating each other up in the big robot suits um that stuff all re- kept made it in and they didn't do m- many reshoots of that but koichi was pr- pretty much him and his team he teamed up with uh makoto and uh, yokoyama and the uh, a team aac and um at that time they were you know commingling their action clubs and different people but <clears throat> uh most of it was was reshot uh i'd love to hear about your martial law experience terrifying <laughs> it's just because i'm you know samo my, my mentor uh the guy i respected and and i ended up actually living in his backyard for three years during the martial law era um uh jimmy his son came in and hung out with me um one time when i was uh, you know, up, up, we were up near the studio in, um, what was that? Near Six Flags. Um, 
uh, and he saw, he, he, you know, I was room, had a roommate. We just had the shower curtain between the cutting, dividing the room. So, so my roommate was over here, Japanese guy, and I'm here. And he saw me. He's like, Ruben, you know, I've got a spare guest house in, in the back. Maybe uh, let me ask my dad if, if you could rent that out. And I'm like, what? That's a possibility. So um, he said yes. And I ended up uh, living in, in Samuel's guest house for, for three years. Um, so a portion, a big portion of those that time, especially season two of martial law was when I moved in. Uh, there was many mornings where I'm taking Samo to work and <laughs> driving him, you know, uh, his driver didn't show or something. And I get a knock and like, Roman, can you take Samo to, to set? And I'm like, Oh, okay, sure. Um, and, uh, but I also, got in to 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 fight him so on there was a couple of scenes and so it wasn't to the later seasons but or later in second season but yeah you're you know you live in this guy's backyard for a while you're you know he's he invites you in to to uh have dinner and to eat with his family and now your your moment is there where I have to run and, you know, and run up to him and, and get knocked in the face or kicked or whatever it was. Um, it's like, I don't want to mess up. So the uh, uh, talk about uh, the nail that sticks out <laughs> and being so nervous and making sure I, you know, as a goon, I hit my mark and uh, oh my God, the ner- it was like the most nervous day of my life. Um, and then uh, I went and did it, but it was, it was, it was terrifying. So, um, uh, and then after that, you know, after you, you, you get beat up a couple of times by your hero, you, you get used to it and you're like, okay, beat me up some more. <laughs> and then, and then, then it's like, yeah, anytime, anywhere, just beat me up. It's okay. Did you find that you, the uh, training that you had in Japan helped you or did you have to break oh, any bad, did you fi- have to break any bad habits? I think the, be- the only bad habits was trying to strike a superhero pose after everything, every, every martial art thing you do, you're like striking a big superhero pose. Um, where Sam was like, you know, let's, we don't, you don't need to do that. You could just be a goon. Right. And you don't have to be these big superhero guys. Um, so that was really the only super bad habit, I think, but absolutely the training uh, I always say if i had gotten if i had not had that training through um with uh alpha stunts and even prior to that you know that the the increments that i had sort of worked my way up uh if i had skipped any of those steps i would have never gotten the opportunity to to fight jackie on the medallion everything was just perfectly laid out so if i had skipped any of those steps i would have just failed miserably um, because of not just skill wise, but just the mental preparedness that you uh, need to be in those situations and to figure out what everybody's talking about and um, the language of action, right? The, the, the movements and, you know, what, what are they trying to do? So I, I imagine my earlier self trying to be in that situation and not have the vocabulary and not have the, the skill set, and the, the nerves that it takes, you know, to fight your hero on screen, right? And in that situation, I would have crashed and burned terribly. It would have been a horrible experience. Which many very good martial artists have been in that position and have crashed and burned. Uh, and I've I've seen it over and over again. So just super grateful to have that that uh, stepping stone. I've heard that some of the older school stunt guys, and I, it seems like the Western style bar brawling stunt guy style is, right. you know, that kind of hold over from the Batman TV show, and <laughs> uh, and it has this wrecking ball quality to it, which you know, there's part of me that really loves this stuff. Um, they're going to throw a punch and they're going to commit and they just kind of like, there's no, there's no running in and stopping. Right. That's right, the right. Hong Kong style. It's like, you know, you're off stage at the, at the opera and you run in and you start fighting. That's almost its own art. Right. Um, were there any times where, you know, Samo made a demand where you say like, Oh, well, I've never, I've never done something that I've never moved like that before. Obviously you rose to the occasion, but I'd love to hear an example. 
Yeah, on 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 uh, the medallion, there was uh, it was very challenging because uh, these guys, when you when you, especially in like martial law, when when these guys work in the states, you have unions, you have uh, you know nice craft service table, you have uh, certain things in in place that keep people from working and overworking. And going to work on the medallion in Hong Kong, and I had worked on some sets prior, but from a stuntman's perspective, prior uh, working on set in as an actor, right? Even a stunt actor in Hong Kong or Japan, it's a very different experience than the stuntman. Um, when you're a stuntman in Hong Kong, it's it's a very different experience than being a stuntman in the States you're there's a there's a lot more demand uh from you as an individual for uh uh from the hong kong perspective uh or a japanese stunt team perspective and it's starting to change now i'm seeing more more american stunt people take the responsibility of having wearing many hats but before uh at least in the 90s um the stunt world was very much i'm a stunt man i do this i fall down i do that there's no overlap of responsibilities uh which now it's changing but before there wasn't so uh you know a hong kong stunt man back in the 90s you were an actor actor first and foremost because you're on screen so whether you whatever your idea of what a stunt man is throw that out because you're a performer, you're on screen, you're playing a character first and foremost. Second, now you're a stunt man and your job is to make the hero look good. So your timing is impeccable, your um uh you know where you're positioning and what you and the marks and hitting all that stuff. Three, you're also a um <clears throat> a prop master. So you have to <laughs> make things functional things for your action scene to work. Uh, so you know you're working with the prop creators, but you're probably doing most of the work because things have to break and things have to, you know, uh, and that's a whole nother department in the US is is the prop side of things. And and uh there's unions to control those different jobs. Um and then you're even uh, hair and makeup to a certain extent because you're, you know, if you have to deal with the powder and you're dealing with clothes and wires and different things, so you're at now you're having to make sure everything works and looks good on film uh, in a in a functional sense for your wardrobe, um, and you're also uh, um, when it comes to the lighting and 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 the set pieces and other things that move around the set, you have to be aware of all of that. And that's what Samo taught me uh, in the early days is that uh, that you pay attention to everything on set because it's a, the synergy of everything. So I learned very early not to be that I was never going to be the hero when it comes to a movie set and you can't just sit there and just do nothing. Like there's always something to be done because it's a it's a it's a group effort and and wherever you see a lack somewhere, go help that person out. And it was very hard coming back to the States after being in the environment. And, you know, you're on union shows and you're like, don't touch that. You'll get fined. Or, you know, that's my job. And you're like, it's clearly you're like, wait, I can help. I can make your job easier and we can get through the scene much quicker. Um, and as indie filmmaker, you know this well, too. Um, you know, that's it's sort of how things have to work on an independent filmmaking budget and schedule but uh, that was sort of the norm in hong kong where in the states it was it was quite different so talk about what it's like working with jackie physically and um relationship wise too and how it was different than working with samo similarities jackie and samo both i mean all it, just the whole, going back to the the this sort of the hong kong um work ethic it's brutal like <laughs> you you 16 hour days minimum right and you go and you sleep just a few hours and you're back and there's no like 
12 hour turnaround union rules that that uh, govern any of that stuff. So you're basically back to work when when Jackie's back and Jackie and Sema both being crazy workaholics, you, you know, you're you're pretty much there all the time and you're being very sleep deprived. Uh, so uh, but that energy that they carry and the passion for making a, a, a cinema work and, you know, trying new cool things, it definitely is contagious. So you're there and you're trying to figure things out. And, um, and then there's a lot of ridiculous things that you're like, that's never going to work. What are we doing? <laughs> but you go through it and you find, you know, what works and what doesn't. And that's where a lot of the, the magic of, I think, Hong Kong cinema is because they're just constantly in experimental mode. They're constantly trying something new, constantly. Oh, they were. I don't, these days things have changed, but <clears throat> that was the magic back then. Um, working with Jackie, uh, you know, by that time he had just come off of uh, Tuxedo. So he was already now uh, quite famous and worldwide. Uh, his team they were exhausted, you know, following him from movie to movie. Um, and he had an eclectic team uh, of, you know, uh, Hong Kong old school guys, Korean new school guys, um, and uh, a couple of Chinese, mainland Chinese guys. <clears throat> and they uh, they worked crazy hard hours. Um, Samo's team was mostly because by this time Samo had done martial law, some time had passed, and he was really uh trying to get back into more of the director side of things. And his team wasn't as fresh because uh the the team that he worked with in, in America was uh a combination of the old school Samo um Hungarban and the uh some new school american guys and you know uh it wasn't his his original team so we were kind of in hong kong and thailand working with a couple of samuel's original guys which were old school guys and the thing that i noticed and that i would hear from the stunt community guys they're like they would ask me it's like you so i hear you with samo and i'm like uh yeah and they're like so you're Hungarban. I'm like, yeah, I'm Hungarban. And then they were like, this is good, you know. And they would point over to, to Jackie and his team and like, you know, good money, but no loyalty. And I was, and I was like, huh, oh, that's weird. Um, and what I realized throughout that whole experience is uh Jackie had he definitely took care of his guys like he'd take them out to dinner and everything but there was a more personal um relationship that Samo would have with his guys and where he would invite them over to his hotel room and make them dinner so he'd be you all day and and you would feel like miserable and like what am I this guy hates me what am I doing like am I gonna have a place to live when I go back home um I'm not going to get kicked out of his backyard, but every day he would feed us and he would make these massive meals and Sam would just love to eat. Um, so clearly his size shows it, but uh, uh, he was a great cook and he would cook and, uh, and invite the stunt team over to his home. Uh, and, you know, as far as my sort of seeing those two dynamics is, is Jackie kept a little distance between him and his team. And, uh, you know, he'd go and do his thing and he'd bring everybody together and have dinner. And he treated our, you know, both teams all the time. But <clears throat> there was, it was, it was some interesting observations at the time. I always wondered about the, the difference between those two guys, because they are so different. And, you know, Jackie being kind of the outsider and Samo being the big brother. Did you ever get a sense of that? Like, I mean, this is this oh yeah record. Yeah, this is yeah, this is a whole this is a whole other can of worms. Definitely, there was a competition between the two for sure. Uh, even when I was there, I mean, it was clear that Jackie was the winner in the sense of popularity, right? But Samuel being big brother in the Peking Opera School, right? So they were he was always big brother. He was always Jackie's, you know. 
and he was he was very strict with Jackie. He's on set too. The only guy that can make Jackie do anything is Samo. And on set too, Samo would yell at Jackie, and Jackie would be like, oh, okay, yeah, <laughs> you know, he gets in and he does it, and you're like, what? What's Jackie doing? Um, so there was this sort of weird dynamic of you know uh upperclassmen you know lower classmen or, or big brother little brother kind of thing and yet and jealousy too there was some jealousy things going on uh, i respect them both uh, uh there's definitely a bigger place in my heart for samuel because i get to live in his backyard and he let me into his world so um uh so i'll never you know eternally grateful for for that um, there was another thing too that I never forget that um, uh, Jackie uh, approached me one time on the set, uh, and he he looked he, he was like, "So uh, you're with you're with Samuel, right?" And I said, "Yeah, yeah. He's 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 my he he took he took me in and sort of uh, showing me this stuff, and I'm here because of him." And he goes, oh, "Okay, that's that's very good. You're very loyal to Samuel." Then I said, "Yes," <clears throat> and he said. Um, well, if you ever, uh, if you ever want, you know, there's a, there's a place uh, on my team for you. If you, if you ever decide to to change your mind. And I, it was like, I was super like honored and like, Oh my goodness. And uh, it, that always stuck in my mind. And I was like, wow. You know, cause I, at that time I was working with Brad and uh, we, we started building a relationship and I just, you know, had a uh, uh, mass respect for, for Brad and, and, you know, what being the first white guy to get that to that level on, on the, on Jackie's team <clears throat> um, was, was, you know, something to be uh, proud of for sure. Uh, and uh, anyways, I sort of was like, wow, that's super cool. Okay. We'll see what happens. And then uh just because of my personal relationship with Sam, I just knew that if I had ever done that, like it would, it would not go over well. So, uh, so I, I never pursued that, that offer and, uh, and, and very happy because later one, one of the uh, mainland Chinese guys, um, Guanghua, who was part of originally on that um, uh, for that job originally was on Samo's team. He defected and went to, uh, you know, Jackie's team and never heard the end of that from Sam. Every he was always cursing that, you know, that, that guy. Um, so I, I I also got a taste of what it would have been like <laughs> if I had defected, yeah. what kind of betrayal that would have been in Samuel's eyes. So yeah. uh, they don't take that stuff lately. So I was yeah. I'm glad I was didn't stir up the pot. <clears throat> hey, did you ever meet Xiao Ho on uh Hungaban? Was he ever around? He was the Mad Monkey Kung Fu guy, Northern style dude. He so he might have been part of Lao Gaban at the time. Okay, uh, Lao Gaban. Well, no, because he was working with Samo in like '89. So I think Xiao Ho. Do you remember um, Mad Monkey Kung Fu and Lady is the Boss? And he was a Shaw Brothers like star. I was wondering if you ever ran into him. Um, I don't think so. Um, that name sounds familiar, but I don't think I ever <clears throat> met him. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing your Hong Kong movie story. <laughs> yeah. man. Is, thanks for going back, going back down memory lane. It was yeah, like... yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Changing the topic. Uh, I have a memory of going to the Zero Gravity website and seeing your photo on there at one point. Yeah. Like, oh, what was that connection? How did that happen? Uh, that was so I had reached out to was it Carrie, I think, first. Carrie Wong. Or maybe he was down, or maybe he showed up. I was I was with Bruce Kahn, and we were doing the uh, ACT school down in uh, at the C CBS. Either either I met him, somebody introduced me to him, or I saw some uh, some videos and reached out. I forget what what happened, but yeah, t I had definitely teamed up with at uh, that time. Larry Carey were here. Sam Locke had came later, a little bit later, came down to Cal uh, LA. At that time, we were, I was just blown away at how talented they were for not having any kind of like schooling in the sense of, you know, Japan Action Club or, or, um, uh, you know, the stuffs that, that, that they were putting together. And I was like, how do you guys do this? And like, well, we just watch it and copy. And, you know, I know that's your part of your story as well. So yeah, it, it was just a, a, 
talent that I recognized, you know, I was like, they've got potential and sort of invited them to come and start training. And, and at the time I, I just started my company, uh, with a Japanese friend of mine that actually was on set of that first movie. It was still the early days right after, you know, after the matrix and after, um, uh, this Hong Kong wave was just hitting the U S as far as the film world. And there wasn't a ton of people that understood that style and could work within those rhythms. And that was kind of what I was trying to help usher in to the, to the U S um, was to introduce, you know, let's take action cinema a little bit differently. And, and that those were kind of the early days of that. Was this Just Cause that you're talking about, your company? Yeah, Just Cause was the company. And Was uh, it a production we, company at first or a mocap company at first? Production company, yeah. Mocap was just something that we got into because uh, <laughs> the, the, demand, the video game thing started kicking off and we just started naturally moving into that into that world but yeah originally it was we just we were going to make some cool action movies and and then it turned into a whole video game side project yeah you left quite a legacy there not many i don't know probably not many mocap studios around at the time um when when did when did you get into mocap the first as a performer uh in japan actually so i think it was in <clears throat> nine, oh yeah 97 so in 97 i did uh a mocap gig for Resident Evil Code Veronica. So uh, I got hired as uh, Chris Redfield as to play the role of Chris Redfield for the mocap. So I got that experience and I got to work with some of the Japanese developers. And that's when I sort of was like, okay, something's, there's got to be a better way to do this. Why are these guys hiring all Japanese performers when ultimately this thing is going to be in English going out to the world? So then that's when, as sort of a side project with, with Just Cause, my partner and I started pitching to Japanese companies that, hey, we could cast actors out of the States, bring them to Japan, do the mocap for the cinematic scenes, and have a more authentic sort of real performance when it comes to performing them in the native language of English as opposed to Japanese and then converting to, to, to there's this whole sort of, I call it the reverse bad kung fu movie um uh, kind of uh effect where it's uh the the wor words coming out of the mouth and the body just don't match up exactly because we're having to dub into english what these japanese performers are nothing against their performance but they're performing it in japanese and the body language uh doesn't quite match especially the interpretation you have a japanese actor who has they're trying to pretend to be american with their body and it looks everything just comes out really unnatural so the idea was to pitch to these game companies, hey, with our production company, we can hire legit actors out of the States to perform mocap and do um, do it in a native native English language. So anyways, that, that was sort of, that got us on that trajectory and then games like Devil May Cry and Resident Evil and all that stuff, it just kind of took off from there. Were you still being directed by a Japanese director though when you were performing for these games in, in America? Uh, yes, yes, it's still a Japanese. So there was a lot of, um, on my behalf and my, co our company's behalf, we had to work with directors and educate them on the nuances in, in culture and how some things may be super funny in Japanese. That's not going to translate really well in, 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 a, <laughs> for English, uh, Americans and English speakers. Um, and vice versa, what we think is super hilarious, you know, the Japanese just don't get it. And then you're like, okay, we, let's not waste a lot of time on that and let's moving on. And, uh, so really it was, a, a, a nice case study for myself and for our company of finding common themes of, um, of, of language and body movements that, uh, both cultures can, um, you know, whatever, what's the intention, right? What's the intention of the scene or the the story or the, whatever that we're doing in that, in that moment, find the ultimate intention and then finding what's going to work best in both languages uh, to, to, to carry that intention. What are some examples? I'd love to know, like, 
were there specific gestures, fight scenes? Like, how did you find? What is it like? It's kind of like a lowest common denominator, almost. Right. <laughs> right. Or like, or is it like a new way of movement? Well, yeah, some things. So, for example, like there's this one pose, right? And uh, I'm not going to do it properly, but like I'm leaning on my knees, and then this wanted to do something like this that is very much of a, in a Japanese culture, very much of a sort of a yankee or a lower level uh, Yakuza type guy who's does this kind of gestures like, hey, come come over here, you know, get, uh, I got something for you, which it's, we don't really have that in our culture from that, that kind of, uh, you know, chimpita uh, uh, Yakuza kind of, <laughs> low life guy which we have like some of some italian mafia kind of thing that's probably the closest thing but it's not really the same so ha- finding and trying to explain to the japanese guys that you know uh it may be fun for them you know blonde haired character or whatever doing that kind of movement uh but most americans aren't going to get it so how do we f- change the movement to <laughs> something that would still be funny or you know what's the intention why are you trying to get this uh what's the laugh you're trying to get here maybe we can come up with something different and so there's a lot of that kind of stuff um uh that, that happens in 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 the translation process of of these games yeah that's that's fascinating like what i mean did you find yourself was there a sort of pattern or some kind of like rule that you ended up falling back on where it's like well japanese movement is like this american movement is like this maybe we find something in the middle or maybe we veered more towards american so what i found worked really well is um the the pacing of drama scenes in in uh dialogue i think the the american pacing right where we were able to convince the japanese with is like, hey, when it comes to the uh, to the dialogue scenes, let's just let let's let that work organically and naturally, and let's not try to do any kind of craziness to it. And, and in an exchange, when it comes to action, let's go full, you know, Japanese with the action. And that's where we found the really good balance is because the Japanese, in, in especially with anime. There's a word that we use all the time called medihari, which is uh, it's it's kind of um, extremes. You know, when you're like in a speed ramp, you're going and then you go like really quick or it's like the punch and then it this big explosion. Like you're skipping a couple frames almost to, to get that explosive effect. That's medihari. So when it comes to action, to have this distinction from going slow to a big explosion or, you know, like the typical hero pose, instead of like looking like that, it's like, you know, you know, snappy movements, right? So you need that medihari to uh, express the action tends to work universally. Audiences recognize this, this medihari. They may not know what it is. They may not know that terminology, but uh, when it comes to action scenes, and I think there's been an organic evolution of, uh, Hollywood action scenes that are adapting this medihari that's come from Asia cinema for from such a long time ago, but we we know what what feels good and what works as human beings. And um, when it comes so, to action, medihari is awesome, right? It really creates a, a dynamic um, scene, and, and and that's what we want. That's what our goal is usually with action cinema. So having that contrast between the two and sort of t- telling the uh, or ha- having the um, Japanese uh, directors and stuff sort of le- let let the uh, <clears throat> the dramatic scenes uh, play a little more in American style and then the action a little more in Japanese style. And that's a good balance. Usually I'm thinking about um, when I was doing God of War because they had they came from the very Hong Kong style also and again this is just trial and error right for for me and so when I got on stage to do God of War uh, when I throw a punch I I would go wow I would throw it like a Hong Kong a Hong Kong fight scene it's like I'm on the punch what's next that's how I threw a hook punch like throwing the hook what's next right they started teaching me to do 
a big wind up, a big, you know, big arc, big hitbox. And then the recovery needed to be alive. They didn't want me to stick anything. So it was like the movement curve was like anticipation, hitbox, recovery, and then settle to idle. Like there was constant movement. And it was like a Disney animation. Right. And uh, so I was breaking down movement like that. But then when I did Demon Souls, I had to kind of go back to the Hong Kong stop, but almost like an extreme version of it where I didn't even build up before an attack. It was just like like minimal anticipation and then just attack and hit a pose. And then there might be a slight move out of that pose. Um, but, you know, that, that was like when you're talking about Medi Hardy, it was like, oh, yeah. That ramp that you're talking about, yeah, that was definitely something I experienced on Demon Souls, and that's and that I think it comes from again going back to the Chambada, so we can look at our roots, and you have you know the samurai holding the sword, and you have the two uh, samurai fighting, and we see this classical scene, right? The sun setting, they're standing there, a little twitch in the feet maybe, but there's very little movement and it's there and it's there and it builds up and the anticipation and then bam! And just one quick, you know, like the old Western movie too, but one quick stroke and it's just a one simple cut in the story. You know, that's that's Japanese cinema is is all, is that, that's that Mehdi Hardy uh, from uh, going from nothing to everything and then back to nothing. Um, where, like you said, Disney, there's this constant movement or constant thing. And then Hong Kong action cinemas, it's all, it's a whole nother story. But, uh, but I feel, um, you know, if we go back in history and I'm sure there's cinema historians that, you know, are making these connections, but it's fun for us, you know, grunts who've been on the, in the, in the thick of it to, to, to play around and see where these things are coming from where they're going i'm reading a uh, chinese history book right now which i've never done and i was like it's time it's time for me to learn chinese history and the emergence of triad groups as these kind of mm -hmm. secret societies along trade routes which were just militias at the time and these militias are pretty no nonsense they didn't really they probably had mantis clubs and snake clubs they probably had these things right these are like secret handshakes mm -hmm. but then when it came time to actually like, collect money they pulled out the choppers and they'd go to work. And it's kind of like that is two kind of languages within the same system. And I'm thinking now, too, about, you know, the Old West, uh, the gunslinger mm -hmm. fight and the bar brawl. Right. Uh, and also the swashbuckling genre in America and in, and in Europe, because in America, the swashbuckling genre is very, it's very Hong Kong, mm -hmm. you know, and it's designed so that, you know, the average actor can do can do it easily but when you have a performer who is actually able to do it it's actually kind of shot like hong kong style but do you think that um now i'm just now i'm just spitballing here but because i was thinking too about um japanese wrestling and uh creature fights and like the the what's what is it called the you know godzilla style fights mm -hmm. okay uh i guess it's a form of tokusatsu but it's it's right. a little bit bigger yeah, I guess wrestling and Godzilla fights, there is some resemblance there. Um, interesting, interesting. It's it's fascinating to see where all this comes from. And then you have, you know, the whole uh, Mexican style, yeah. uh, which is a very aerodynamic. Uh, a lot kind of, of this, is, a lot of going back. Of, and forth. Yeah. Right. And then, and then if you look back at the, even like Hong Kong cinema, you've got the... Um, uh, different camps of you know the the Wu Pings and the the Wu family, and then you have the other the Peking Opera family, the um, the Jackie Samo yep. clan as well. So in their very different style, Madame um, Fox, right? Madame Fo Fox School. I can't remember her name. And and Lar Kar Long, who had more of this vertical up and down style of filming fights and stuff. The the classic Drunken Master scene, uh, Drunken Master Two in the in the tea shop um the, there's just so many you know different trails you can go but it's it's fascinating uh when you're in it and you're and recognizing the different lineages and cultures and um languages around these things and then how eventually it makes its way into hollywood and the big you know mm -hmm. all of that training i did too 
with with training and experience with Jackie and Samo, uh, I say prepared me for um, Avatar and working with Cameron and Garrett Warren. <laughs> Have you ever worked with Garrett? <laughs> yeah, I worked with then, Garrett once. So, uh, so it was just like, oh, I'm back in Hong Kong. <laughs> it's like, there's no difference. <laughs> and it was very easy. It was like, uh, you know, there was no um, something I was very used to with, with the way uh, the operating systems and the way they, uh, what they demanded and, and what um, was uh, expected and what was, was done. So I f- it felt very much at home for me. So when I got on set of Avatar, uh, you know, I was already very familiar with mocap as well with the games. So that was something at the time, not so much these days, but at the time it was still kind of new for the stunt industry. There was a, only a few of us who had um, been in mocap suits and in, in the video game world, mostly having that experience. So when it came to film, most most of the film guys had no experience with mocap. So that was sort of it was the perfect uh, combination of all of my life experiences getting me to that one spot. So when I got on set of Avatar, uh, filling in for Ilram one day um, because he couldn't make it, so uh, I finally got the call, and then that was that. Uh, you know, getting in there and, uh, and and getting to work with those guys, it, it was again, it just felt it felt at home because I was already there. <laughs> I was already doing all this stuff. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. And I mean, did that, did that then lead into more uh, stunts in American films? It did. Um, it did. I, I, you know, I had my run. Um, Garrett introduced me to a lot of uh, for, for a few shows and did, did some stuff, but for me, um, it was very hard for me to be on set when uh, um and and I'm sure you've been in this position too, when you're, you're watching some choreographers and fight stuff kind of get put together. Uh, and, and not so much these days, these days people understand it better and, and, and are not, um, and, and the level is way up there, but there's been back in the day when you'd be in on set and you're just like, this is where it feels like, uh, you know, it feels like we're in a time machine 10 years ago or something. And you're like, what are we struggling with this for? because maybe the cameraman doesn't get it or the director doesn't get it or, you know, or whoever, you know, the, the coordinator at the time or whoever's there. So it, it, you're dealing with um, a lot of just people who just don't understand the the craft. And uh, it's like trying to put a, you know, a square peg in a round circle and it's just chaos. So I, I hated being in those positions. So I kind of avoided them and, and just, um, would take the call to work on certain shows with certain people because I knew there was some really good people that knew what they were doing. And I knew I wouldn't get so frustrated if I uh, hung around certain people. So, so yeah, that was, so that kept me from working in the Hollywood industry for too, too extensively, but I definitely got to work with some really cool people over the years. Yeah. It's really no different in Hollywood in a lot of ways. Like you kind of have to be with the school with a crew you have to right. demonstrate loyalty and some of these groups are great man and then some groups they want you to go out and uh, do coke with them after the show oh, man and they want you to do like bad stuff or whatever it is right so it's just, right, right. it just depends on who you're running with i could see a lot of guys getting sucked into that when i was there and i never yeah. lived in la um but i would I, I did my pilgrimages a few times and had a conversation one time uh the guy said uh he said, you can come here and make six figures right now. And I said, yeah, but could I do what I want to do, which is make right. these. I, was, I, I, was, I wanted to make rope dope at the time, right? That was like the next thing. This was back yeah. in 2012. And so I wanted to do that stuff. I said, can I do stuff like that? And he goes, so wow. yeah, I didn't go. I ended up uh, living the poor life instead. And poor, poor, maybe financially, but uh, not spiritually. Not- not spiritually and not yeah with your heart and what your desire to me that's worth way more than than six figures and uh and especially now where i'm at you know still doing my own thing it's not action cinema anymore it's it's diving into strange esoteric (laughs) ufos and goofy subjects but uh 
still a lot of fun and uh and and just knowing that you know we're we're following our passion we're doing what we love because we love it and seems to be something there supporting us to keep doing this stuff in in this way so uh, yeah yeah i want to ask you also uh did you ever um did you ever look at mocap as a you know at just cause as a way to do productions and make films oh absolutely yeah that was a big part kind of where the industry is going now with you know game engine running uh we can go directly real time into game engine technologies that was something i was trying to pioneer at the time actually with unreal and it's funny one of my ex-employees is now one of the top uh guys over at uh unreal engine and um uh and it's it's and he's doing that work you know integrate he was part of the the whole uh lucas films with the uh setting up the virtual studios for um mandalorian and uh and the unreal engine so uh so yeah i think that direction is super interesting the potential that mocap has in bridging these worlds of anime and hong kong cinema and you know tokusatsu like there's a uh there's definitely those modalities um integrated with the the mocap stuff i I see there's a lot of potential cool stuff that's being developed now but also more more there's definitely more avenues for that uh i've left that world because my interests have sort of pushed me into some other directions but still fascinated and like to keep up on the up and up of what's going on with the, especially with the tech developments and a big techie and love that stuff. So it's interesting. I think that world is a natural evolution for artists and creatives like yourself to find ways to do things and, 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 and uh, think outside of the box kind of thing. Cause you're limited with this physical reality, right. With our, you know, even with wires and everything else. And, and cuts right we're still thinking in the traditional film sense of what how to cut around this like if we're trying to do this move right and how do i cut around this um so the the uh, advent of animation and uh, motion capture and keyframing like all of these things come together uh, when when you're playing with uh mocap and and i feel there's some really cool things yet to be developed and, and created in that world totally agree i want to ask too i never and we never really talked about you learning japanese um mm-hmm. this is a weird question but i'm going to try it do you ever find yourself thinking japanese like does that cause one to move differently by thinking japanese <laughs> as opposed to thinking english yeah because i think absolutely english. Yeah. Yes, it does. It does. And and my body movements change when I'm speaking Japanese as opposed to when I'm speaking in English. And that was the realization that created the pitch to the these Japanese companies to do the mocap in English as opposed to Japanese, because um absolutely it's cultures, language is culture, you know, language develops from uh, uh, a culture or vice versa. They feed each other, it's a two-way pump. And uh, within those cultures, and you have, you know, again, we keep reiterating the samurai culture in the Japanese culture, right? It's a big key part of their culture coming, you know, hundreds of years of of that type of movement. Uh, And there's a lot of words that are integrated into um, movement. You know, and, and that, and, and coming from that influence of samurai and class and different, you know, that whole culture that they have, where they have a class system, and the samurai being this, this sort of everyone, everyone wants that class. Everyone wants to be the samurai in the in the town, sort of thing, because it comes with it a certain nobility and uh, uh, different things. So yeah, it's it's totally integrated uh i switch back and forth i do think in japanese i think in english uh it depends usually who i'm talking to uh in in my environment but um 
it's a different, it's, it's different for sure. Different mannerisms, different physicality. You know, I found when I, um, I learned Cantonese for about three years um, and I was okay conversationally. And the only way nice. I could really learn it was like a song because of the tones. Mm -hmm. With Japanese, the way that I, and I, I only took maybe a year of Japanese. I went there, couldn't speak it worth a damn. Easy to pronounce, almost impossible to construct a, a thought. <laughs> I would, I would, you know, I want to make a complex thought, and like I, I had some things out of order, and they're like, "Wait, are you, are you drinking the coffee, or is the coffee <laughs> drinking you?" Like, and it's like, don't you know? Right. <laughs> right, right, right. But you, uh, you think, you think people, yeah, yeah, but it's just that's just like the way the grammar of thinking, really. Um, and then so it was almost like there was a grammar to the sing songiness of. Cantonese Mandarin to some extent also, but Mandarin has far fewer sounds. Um, but Cantonese, I mean, it, it's like, I would remember entire like paragraphs as like, as if it was a song in my head and that same kind of song would like, it would, I felt like I was using those same neuron clusters when I would memorize choreo Hong Kong style. Mm hmm. Right. Where it was like, yeah. it was very much, you know, okay, I've got 10 moves. I'm going to kind of go through and I'm trying to like perfect. It's, it's like jazz or, you know, or playing in a band, but then the Japanese movement. And I, I've never had that. I've never been able to actually perform with other Japanese performers. The closest I ever got, well, I did work with one Japanese dude, but the closest I really got to working with alpha stunts was I did a, did a movie with Johnny and um, mm -hmm. Johnny Obash. And when I was first working with him, he was moving at this different rhythm. It was like right. two jazz players, like we were here. Right, right, right. <laughs> we, we, we weren't finding it. It was like he was slightly, like he was slightly ahead of me, but we, but like a little bit of dialing and we nailed it. Um, and again, he's alpha stunt, so it's much more of the Hong Kong style. Right. But, you know, when you're working with Japanese movers, um, whether I, I assume like Japan Action Club style uh, mm -hmm. performers, do you have to go into a different mode to work with them? Yeah, totally. It's uh, it's like you said, dilating it in. So finding um, the, from the Japanese, from the Japan Action Club to Kurata, very di it was very different styles. And one would yell at me for training over at the other place. They're like, "Oh, I see you picked up some Japan Action Club habits, huh?" <laughs> you know. And then I go back to the other one. They're like, "Oh, you've been training with those Kurata guys again, have you?" You know picking up some bad habits. So totally, it's a different, you have to dial it in for who you're working with. And, um, but the, the, the base is not that difficult, not that different, not as drastic as what you probably were dealing with on God of War with, you know, the, the Disney style or, you know, this, this, this American way of big haymakers and that kind of stuff. So it still was in the, similar uh class structure <laughs> uh there was medi hari there's faster beats there's this a little more of the hong kong rhythm even in the sentai stuff it's still there and not as uh as drastic as the american stuff so old school american action is very different <laughs> than than uh but it's you know it's so cool to see this evolution over the years and sort of our generation of folks uh teaching the new you know the new new kids the new generation is coming they're coming out and they're they're on it they're not slowing down they get it and they're picking it up fast and uh it just seems to be this constant evolution of integrating what's cool you know i think everything has its place but ultimately you know the stuff that works is is the stuff that continues to you know we're only going to improve on the stuff that works the stuff that doesn't work, we're going to let that fall to the wayside. And man, just going back and watching movies from 10 years ago and some of the action movies that were coming out, it's just like, ooh, ooh, cringe. How, like, did, we that, that? Yeah. how did we get away with that? Yeah. yeah. yeah so, you watch like some, you know, I went back and watched some Rocky fights and I was like, damn, the half of these are misses and they're playing it like they hit and we didn't right. care. Nobody cared. Didn't, nobody cared. Yeah, nobody it's like the, maybe our eye changed or something. Like you just see things differently. I think that's what happens is the, the audience gets educated. And with the integration of Hong Kong cinema 
and guys like Jackie and Jet and Samo, you know, paving that way um, and, you know, creating uh, a more critical eye for the audience to, to be uh, critical of and grow and get educated. And because now they're, they're, they're connecting with the scene, you know, now you have, you know, guys like Sam Hargrave and the 8711 guys, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, they're now, you know, the, the new mainstream action guys. Right. So uh, our, our audience is at least uh, evolved to this new standard of action for the most part. I think it's hard. It's going to be hard for, for the industry to go backwards. It does happen, but. Yeah. You never know. There might be some, you know, every now and then you get like a born identity style movie where right for some reason for some reason it takes off it taps into something within the audience yeah. um a lot of us in the industry we don't like it but at the same time like maybe i don't know maybe we're a little bit out of touch maybe we need to be able to see things through the audience's eyes sometimes because the audience again like we live this stuff every day right. so when we're you know we have a knife in our hand and we do this that, 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 it, it makes sense right it makes sense right. to us. you get three hits with high low okay god i'll do this right it's very like we're kind of I wouldn't say we're desensitized to it, but we have a grammar yeah. about this stuff. But the audience tends not to. And so when the audience sees da 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 da, they just they they don't really know what to think of it. It's movement. Um, mm -hmm. that's why sometimes fight scenes suck, but the drama's good, so therefore the movie does fine and right. <laughs> you continue to have bad action. Um, right. And uh Seen that a lot. yeah, so but yeah, I, I I think overall though, you're right. I think that the late 90s was a was a very high moment in hollywood with that kind of hong kong spillover of these guys and then yeah. suddenly everybody's just going like cool let's see it <laughs> you know everyone yeah. was down you know nobody was like ah, get that asian off my screen like nobody even yeah <laughs> there's none yeah. of that you know? we loved it yeah um, we had uh charlie's angels we had well the matrix opened the door but then charlie's angels came in then we had um Shows like martial law, we had. Um, Remember the Musketeer, <laughs> the Musketeer. That's right, that's right. We had that show. So, and it was for a minute there. There was like a big boom, and then uh, then it pulled back a little bit, and now it's starting to, it's finding its its balance now. Where you know, because we'd still have extreme shows where we'd have really good action shows, and then we'd have really terrible <laughs> shows. And you're like, how is this? How can these two exist in the same universe? And then, so now it's the pendulum, I think, is is coming back. And we're kind of most, there is now, I feel, a certain level. When I'm watching shows these days, I'm like, oh, okay, this is not as bad as I thought it was going to be. Or, you yeah. know, when it comes to the action, I'm like, oh, they've stepped up the game. Um, so it's, there's still a lot more to explore, obviously, and to see where action cinema goes. But uh yeah, what are you, what are your thoughts? Where do you want to see it go? Oh, geez, man, I, I would love to see. Um, uh, well, I run a mocap studio, so I'm kind of optimistic about that. Yeah, um, and I want to see, I want to see stunt guys learning Unreal mm -hmm. and going crazy with it. And I, I, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, right now I'm, I'm, I'm really like re-educating myself and trying to just understand uh what makes these action styles tick like what why do things come here and why do they work like why is korean action so hot and why doesn't anybody else do it i mean you kind of see some pieces of it in american cinema but like let's face it like nobody does nobody does korean style action in america it just doesn't yeah it just doesn't exist i don't know what it is like and, your, your, and your that... actor your main actor in a korean film he freaking boxes and he looks like he's been in street fights when he was a kid so there's something right, right. to that well they koreans also have their versions of they have soul action school uh, i've never been to them but i've heard a lot about the history it's very close to japan in their uh stunt schools and groups and things like that it's it, it's a uh, more closer related than say the the hong kong and chinese styles which mostly come from the peking opera stuff so the 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 evolution is more closer to the japanese timeline um with chambada action and stuff only they use taekwondo so. yeah it's it's kind of a, it's such an interesting place like they 
So yeah. Taekwondo comes from Japan. Hapkido kind of comes from Japan and North China. The Hapkido kicks, which are a little bit more wild. And there is this kind of wild Korean style that's like, it kind of looks like Northern Chinese, like wild style, mm -hmm. but clean, like clean footwork. And mm -hmm. like has, it has attitude. <laughs> it doesn't look communist. It doesn't look like, <laughs> you know, it doesn't, it doesn't look like it's been drilled. Right, right, right. Right. That's how like a lot of mainland Chinese action still looks. It looks drilled. Like mm -hmm. the way that, because I worked, I did, you know, I did the mainland Chinese movie and you know, all the stunt guys, like it, it was really hard to get them to just like, just throw a punch. It had to be, it had it like, there was this like, there was like a hot key. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Punch or something. It's like, I just want you to punch and stand <laughs> right. there and, and be a guy. And it was really hard <laughs> to get that. Um, there's something about like, I don't know, maybe, maybe also Koreans have like a better sense of individu individuality. I, I I'm I'm grasping at straws here, but um, yeah, yeah. No, you know, they, they they're yeah. you know, maybe they're like a little bit more westernized. Um mm -hmm. and they're also kind of sick of being controlled by, you know. So there's this very kind of like outside thinking now where they're like, well, fuck mm -hmm. it. I'll just, I'll just be who I'm going to be. And some of those guys, man, like that, uh, Ma Dong Sok guy, Don Lee, uh, the big dude from, um, train to Busan. Remember him? And he did, uh, oh, okay. 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 Yep. Yeah. He did, uh, outlaws also. And he's a huge dude, but he's kind of like a one punch man. But he's just interesting to look at. That's going to be part of this essay, too, is talking about like Korean movement and trying to break that down because gotcha. it's such an interesting place. Because also like Korean grammar is essentially Japanese, but mm -hmm. the vocabulary is Chinese almost. Mm -hmm. So it's like the way, presumably the way they put a thought together would be kind of like Japanese. Right. It has the same uh, reversed uh, subject verb type of. Uh, yeah. Subject, sen object, sen structure. verb, right? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's that's where there's again it's similarities to Japan and in, in in uh but not as uh not as rigid as Japan and in, in uh in I think Japan I think the sword aspect of Japan has bogged them down in a sense. Uh it's a great tool, but like Aikido Shambhara action, you know, everything is coming from this basic movement, right? And you can, and um, that structure, that base is, I think with Koreans, they took that base and they added the kicks, which gets you out of this, just this, right? All the time. <laughs> Am I making any sense? You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, you're always, you got an object here and you're coming from your Heso, right? And you're coming up and it's just like, same with the Aikido, same with the sword. But now when you have legs, you're, everything is opened up and you've got more directions to pick from. And so you're, you're using that as your structure, but you're able to branch out and do a lot more. So, uh, uh, and the emphasis is now on, uh, footwork as opposed to um uh footwork in in, in being flashy and, and big and yeah. as opposed to just being it all here totally. that's like going way back but I, I i feel that what you said too with the individuality stuff that, that you know they're they're not as rigid in the sense of the nail that sticks out of the head yeah uh you know beat it down kind of that saying i'm sure it probably exists in korean culture but it's not as it's not yeah. the driver yeah there has been some some stuff coming out of japan now which is this like raw it might be out of karate school i'm not sure but it's this very kind of raw choreo that kind of looks like flashpoint donnie Yen's movie it's very mm -hmm. raw um and it kind of looks not choreographed sorry i can't remember her name she did this movie called uh baby assassin i think and there's this other movie called hydra it's a little bit wrong, I think, right now because it's really unchoreographed looking, but there's not, but there's no danger to it. Mm -hmm. I think that there would be an opportunity there to get a couple of these Japanese performers and either bring them here or do a movie there and have like a cool international story because that's what made Ong Bak take off, also, which is like you have a cool like human trafficking right. story, it works, right? Or just some kind of like universal plot that appeals to, to everybody or the raid corrupt police right? oh okay so i know i know who did the action yeah sonomura he's a 
He's a Kurata guy. Okay, that's what I thought. Uh, and he's very much into mocap as well. So he did the action for the the Resident Evil movie that I worked on uh, mm. a couple of years ago. Um, and he's he's coming from Shimamura's uh, school as well. Um, but uh, yeah, anyways, he's he's very much he's got the mocap experience, and he's always looking for he's got that um drive to find something new and different to try yeah. and to, to, to experiment and try stuff yeah i think there might be something there because i was thinking about that recently i was like that could be a raid style team up over there if you had a good That's dp cool. and a good right. director and a good script um and like enough time because i know they shoot those movies in like five days they have no money <laughs> i know it's great nice. they shot hydra in five days dude <laughs> it's crazy. insane um you know, one day per fight, probably, and then you know, drama for two days in two locations. Yeah, I'll, I'll, there, man. I'll take a look. I'm just seeing the trailer here. I'll take a look at it. It does the the, the trailer has some interesting moments for it's sure. It's interesting, and she's really good. Yeah. Saori's really good. Um, if I spoke cool. better Japanese, I'd bring her on to this, but um, <laughs> I'll so. check it out. But yeah, yeah if right. you if you need to ever get in touch with those guys, they're they're old family, so I can I'll oh, reach cool. out for you if you need for sure. <laughs> All right. He is definitely a big part of my journey, Koichi. If it wasn't for him uh, and the the knowledge, uh, going back to just to fill this gap in. So uh, all those schools that I was training with, you know, I was saying that I would I got the free pass as the gaijin to go and train with those guys, but I never got proper instructions. Like they never showed me the details. So it's kind of like you know, um, yeah, you can come hang out and fish with us, but we're not going to teach you how to tie the knot. You know, you're just, it's a, there was something missing there. And it wasn't until I was training with Koichi and Yokoyama-san from AAC, those guys, I think because they had lived in the States and they saw that how much of an effort I was trying to make uh, in learning the language and the culture and everything, they took me in, in America, uh, and they gave me those details that I was missing from the, the schools, like that's the cool. stuff that the, 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 how to tie the knot stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. they, they, they really were key to, um, uh, to, for my action cinema knowledge and growth and experience. Like if that's I hadn't cool. had that. I would have never made it so i owe them a lot ruben thank you so much it's been a pleasure yeah Very thanks for take, taking me down memory lane i appreciate it i feel like i could have <laughs> talked to you about a lot of stuff like samo's cooking and i, I oh, smell man. the south cantonese <laughs> cuisine right now mm, pretty cool yeah. man it's an awesome story i hope you uh hope you write a book on it or something someday it's very interesting well well thanks for letting me share in this way in this yeah. fashion i appreciate it Action Talks is available on YouTube, iTunes, and Spotify. Join my telegram at t.me slash Eric Jacobus. You can check out my studio at superalloyinteractive.com. My website and blog is at ericjacobus.com. And be sure to subscribe. Thank you.